Hi, how are you? Welcome to uh, Stories of the Four Courts uh, Slidecast, episode four. And I thought it might be fun uh, before the long vacation uh, to do a few slidecasts on 1921. Because 1921 was a very eventful year for the legal system in Ireland. And it was also 100 years ago this year. So I thought it might be time to perhaps do something on it. And what I'm going to do in this slide cast, because there was a lot that happened in 1921, what I'm going to do in this slide cast is have a look at January to March 1921. And I'm going to start with the situation as it was on the 1st of January 1921. So there was a war of independence going on in Ireland at the time. And an act called the Restoration of Order in Ireland Act 1920 had just been passed providing for trial of offences by court martial, if the military authority so wished. Meanwhile, the four courts were standing empty as litigants were flocking to alternative courts set up by Sinn Féin. And even when judges did have to travel outside Dublin to go to court, they had to travel accompanied by armed convoys because there was so much danger involved. And worse still, there was an act which had also been passed in 1920 called the Government of Ireland Act 1920. And that provided for partition of Ireland into two self-governing polities, Northern Ireland and Southern Ireland, each with their own court system, subject to a shared High Court of Appeal. So the Irish legal system was facing a lot of change, a lot of insecurity, and even physical danger. On a positive note, in 1919, an act called the Sex Disqualification Removal Act had been passed, opening the way to women jurors, barristers, and solicitors. So that was a positive change, but perhaps it didn't seem such a positive change to the men in the law library who were already worrying about whether or not they'd be able to continue in practice and get work. And these are themes that are running through 1921. So I'll be returning them to, to them later and in the next slide cast. But for the moment, let's show you a photo of the Four Courts Dublin as it would have appeared in 1921. So you can see it's a very fine building. And you see this street there running along the um, eastern side of the four courts, down the side of the four courts. And if you walk with me down this street, you will come into the first story that I want to talk about from 1921, which is the man shot down on Greek Street. So Greek Street is just at the bottom of the four courts. It continues on up here, and it's the street you get to if you just walk down the side of the four courts, Chancery Street. So we're now in Greek Street, and in early January 1921, an incident occurred which really set the tone for these uh, three months, first three months of the year. And that is that there was a shooting, a mysterious shooting, near the four courts. And you can see the headline there from the Dublin Evening Telegraph. It says, a wounded man was taken off in motor. The man was of respectable appearance and the affair is shrouded in mystery. The shooting occurred near the corner of Greek Street. And when he fell, wounded in the legs and hips, a whistle was blown and a motor car dashed up. And he was put inside the car and driven off, apparently by the authorities. So he's described as a wanted man. And there wasn't a huge amount about this subsequently in the papers. But it transpires from records in the Bureau of Military History, which is on this very good website here, which I'll also link to um, in the credits for this post, um, that the gentleman in question was Thomas Newell from Galway. And Mr. Newell, in his interview to the Bureau of Military History, gives his accounts of the events of January 1921. And he said that he had been tracking the murder gang in Grafton Street. So the murder gang would uh, be um, responsible for hunting down uh, Sinn Feiners um, and arresting and sometimes killing them. And you, on behalf of Sinn Fein, was trailing some members of the gang at Grafton Street in Dublin when they were caught by them. 
And um, he says that he was first taken to Wicklow Street and they stand against the wall. And then after some 20 minutes, the chief of the murder gang with a squad of seven or eight men made me walk into Greek Street. So they must have taken him by car from Wicklow Street to Greek Street and then put him out of the car and made him walk into Greek Street where he was again stopped and questioned. And when he refused to run, he was pushed in the middle of the street and shot from a range of three or four yards. So it sounds like, in fact, the whole thing was a bit of a setup in Greek Street. And Mr. Newell had been already captured and then was brought to Greek Street where he was made to walk and then he was shot and then he was taken away. And the purpose of this seems to have been to create terror in the vicinity of the courts. And there may have been reason for this, as we'll discuss later. But that was the first event. So the courts hadn't actually started back at this stage and barristers were indeed on holiday. And Irish barristers were very enthusiastic about going on holiday throughout Europe. So the newspapers show accounts of their holidays. Uh, really, they were great travelers, but unfortunately they often got into accidents and trouble on holidays. And on the 8th of January, just after Mr. Newell's arrest at the back of the four courts, an Irish barrister was killed at this station here on the Franco-Swiss border, St. Louis Alsace. And the barrister in question was Mr. Henry or Harry Kennedy. He's a very popular member of the Northwest Bar and he had been junior Crown Prosecutor for the County of Longford. And uh, what had happened was he was traveling back. He must have been on some sort of skiing holiday in Switzerland. And he was obviously traveling back to Dublin for the start of term and he missed his train. So he went in a cab to the next station, which was this station, St. Louis Alsace, to get the train in the hope that he'd catch it because the cab might go faster than the train. And when he arrived at the next station, the, uh, there was a train at the station and he thought it was pulling out. And poor Mr. Kennedy rushed to get on the train, probably with all his skiing equipment, and he fell off and he was killed. And the saddest thing of the whole affair was that it was completely unnecessary because the train in question had only been pulling into the station, hadn't been pulling out. So he had plenty of time to catch it. So that was very sad because he was a young and popular member of the Northwest Bar. And the first act of the Irish Bar before term even started, the Northwest Bar met in the law library and they passed a resolution of condolences to Mr. Kennedy's family. So that was a sad start to term. And there were lots of other reasons for Hillary term, which started at the beginning of January 1921 to be a sad start. So I mentioned earlier about the fact that the Government of Ireland Act proposed to split up the courts. And there was a lot of concern that there wouldn't be enough business for the Southern Bar after the courts were split up. And perhaps this was fanned a little bit by newspaper articles for whatever purpose, because the Northern Whig reported, maybe gleefully, because it was the Northern Whig, it said that business prospects on the whole in the four courts show no improvement as compared with previous terms. So you remember I mentioned the Sinn Féin courts had been set up and the volume of business in the four courts had decreased as a result. And the Northern Whig said, if it were not for the comparatively large body of work from Ulster, the four courts might adopt the short time policy that is now in force in many industrial concerns. So effectively, they said the courts might not even be open on a five day week anymore. There wasn't enough business. And you have the same report in the Belfast newsletter, again, perhaps a little biased, but it said uh, bulk of work from Ulster. It also mentioned, as you'll see, that there would be women uh, on juries. So we'll return to that because that's a little more positive later. But Irish barristers had been kind of bombarded with this news that everything was going to collapse since the 1st of January, when the Dublin Advertiser published this article saying that half of the legal business conducted at the four courts came from Ulster, and that with the transfer of Ulster business to Belfast, as was proposed by the Government of Ireland Act 1920, the prospects for the Bar of Southern Ireland were grim. So, you know, uh, quite a lot of stressed barristers, I'd imagine, at the return uh, to term, though perhaps a little exaggerated because somebody did write in to say, in fact, only a third of the business, maybe even less than that, came from Ulster. But, you know, um, there was a lot of anxiety, I'm sure, about that because barristers are always worrying uh, that work may decline. <laughs> 
So I mentioned also that there was reference in the newspapers to women jurors um, coming down the tracks very soon, that term. And there was a nice speech that was given by Chief Justice Maloney at an event the day after the start of term. It was an event in the RDS in Dublin. And there's Chief Justice Maloney. And he said that he welcomed women barristers and uh, he wouldn't be surprised if there was a woman uh, sitting on the bench in his time as Chief Justice. Now, that never came to pass, but it was a nice thought. It took a lot longer than that uh, for women to, to sit on the bench but uh, certainly in the superior courts. But it was a nice, a nice welcome, I think, to women on the part of uh, Chief Justice Maloney. So he deserves credit for that. But that was a rare bright note. And indeed, immediately after Chief Justice Maloney's speech, there was another catastrophe for the Irish Bar. Again, a mysterious catastrophe. And that was the murder of a leading King's Counsel. And the King's Counsel in question was Mr. William McGrath. And he was murdered at his house in Dublin on the North Circular Road. So it's a house there with the dark blue door, I think. And uh, he was murdered there on the night of the 14th of uh, January. And what happened in this case was that a gang of armed men burst in the front door of his house and they stood in the hall. And Mr. Kennedy was upstairs with his family and his daughter, Maeve, who was only 18 at the time, gave an account of the tragedy to the Freeman's Journal the next day. And uh, it said that she was laboring under much emotion, as I'm sure she was when she gave the account. And she said, about half past one, we heard violent knocking and banging at the front door. A few minutes later, it was burst open. By this time, we were all out of our beds and out on the landing. We heard the noise of men in the hall. Mother and I did all in our power to prevent daddy from going down, but he would go. And as he reached the last landing and was at the top of the first flight of stairs leading from the hall, two shots ran out. So those shots, I'm afraid, did for poor Mr. McGrath. He survived for long enough to receive the last rites and he was taken in an ambulance to um, uh, the original St. Vincent's private hospital on Leeson Street. Uh, but he died shortly afterwards. I think he died at about 9.30 in the morning. So he survived for a few hours after the shooting. And he made a statement to his relatives that might possibly throw some light on the tragedy, but it wasn't stated at the time what that statement was. And indeed, it has never been disclosed to date. So um, the newspaper report said that he, um, there was horror and amazement in the city at Mr. McGrath's death. I think it was the 15th he was actually killed. Uh, there was in the early hours of the 15th, there was horror and amazement in the city at Mr. McGrath's death. There was sorrow among colleagues at the bar and the legal profession because Mr. McGrath was a very well-known figure in the four courts and very popular with those he came in contact with because of his geniality of disposition and high character. And it said that he had been practicing in the courts during the last few days, so he must have been back for the start of term, and it was difficult to realize that he had left them forever. So very sad about Mr. McGrath. He'd also been a successful journalist before he became a barrister, and he had written for the Freeman's Journal. And the Freeman's Journal reported that Mr. McGrath had previously had an experience in his house when a party of men walking in affected an entrance to the house from the back, they marched through the house to the hall, they stood there for a few minutes and then retraced their steps and left by the back. So that was clearly some sort of warning to Mr. McGrath that he was a marked man. But what side were they? Were they the Irish rebels fighting for independence or were they connected with the British military and the Black and Tans and Auxiliaries or the RIC? And that's something we'll explore later. But at the time, there was no real discussion as to who had killed Mr. McGrath. The only thing that was said at the time was that the Northeast Bar, of which Mr. McGrath was a member, he'd have been one of their most successful members, passed a resolution that they deplored Mr. McGrath's killing and they sent their condolences to his widow and family. So that was actually passed in the law library, I think that day on the 15th. So you can see that everyone must have been getting a bit tense in the law library now. And uh, that tension was only increased. The McGrath shooting occurred on a Friday and um, it was only increased the next Monday 
when barristers went to work and they would most of them would probably have been coming from Mr McGrath's funeral and they'd have been coming towards the forecourts probably from the north side because Mr McGrath lived in the north circular road so his funeral was on the north side and they discovered to their surprise that a cordon had been erected around the forecourts in the early hours of the 17th of January 1921. So you can see here just the, a note in the newspaper that a large area had been invested by the military with armoured cars, tanks and full fighting kit. They actually had field kitchens, so it looked a very permanent occupation. And this area was from Capel Street right down to Church Street Bridge. So there was a cordon all around from Capel Street to Church Street Bridge. You couldn't go over uh, the bridge and enter a Chancery Place. Um, you had to go through the Church Street Bridge and go south at the Church Street Bridge. Um, if you were coming from the south side, that was the bridge you had to go over. So, you know, uh, when all the barristers were coming back from Mr. McGrath's funeral, um, suddenly they encountered this cordon. And the Lord Chief Justice Maloney, who we talked about a few minutes ago, got quite annoyed when he discovered that not only was there this cordon there, but when he tried to get down um, by turning, uh, by turning um, east at the Church Street Bridge, the front gates of the forecourts were locked. So barristers at this stage were only able to get in the back gates of the forecourts. And Chief Justice Maloney ordered that these gates be opened and they were opened, which made it a little bit easier for people to get in. And then at three o'clock, um, the cordon was taken down. So it seems to have been from the early hours of the morning on the 17th to about three o'clock in the day. And during this period, there were a lot of entries into adjoining premises. So you can see here, this is actually from that day in the vicinity of the forecourts, uh, you can see doors are being broken open and young men would then have been rounded up and taken to the forecourts hotel, which is where Oris Adali is today and questioned. And the same here in this as well, you can see uh, that they're opening, this may even be Chancery Place, I think, they're breaking open the door of a shop with a tank. So uh, that was all happening in the early hours of the 17th. And nobody seemed to know why this was done because there were no arrests afterwards. I have a theory on this, which I'll share with you later, but uh, everyone was a bit mystified by it at the time. Some people thought it might be because there was a, a, a court case in relation to a gentleman called Thomas Murphy, who had been sentenced to death by court martial. And that was supposed to be on in the four courts that day. And they thought it might be related to it, but I don't believe it was related to it. I believe it was related to the killing of Mr. McGrath. And I'll come back to that later. So that's um, what happened then anyway. So there was a lot of upset over that. And then more upset for the bar as if they weren't intimidated enough by what was happening, more upset for the bar on the 20th of January, 2021, when the first barrister appeared before a court martial, not to defend or prosecute, but as the accused. And this barrister was a gentleman called, um, called Jeremiah Crowley. Uh, he had acted as a Sinn Féin judge in Ballina at a sitting of a Sinn Féin court in Ballina in November 1920, and he had been arrested at the Moy Hotel uh, in Ballina here, and his was the first prosecution of a Sinn Féin judge, the first prosecution of a Republican judge. And the basis for his prosecution was not actually that he acted specifically as judge at the court because they hadn't arrested him in court, it was possession of documents purporting to relate to the affairs of Dáil Éireann, an unlawful association, including a document entitled a Dáil Arbitration Court, Circuit Court, Winter Sitting, and notes of the proceedings and the judgments. So they were getting him on the documents charge. And uh, he was subsequently found guilty. Uh, he pleaded not guilty, but he also said he didn't recognize the authority of the courts. And he said his plea of not guilty was based on lack of moral guilt. He asked for a definition of guilt and whether it included moral guilt. And when it said moral guilt, he said he was pleading not guilty, but he didn't recognize the authority of the courts. So he was subsequently, um, uh, he was subsequently sentenced to two years hard labor. And uh, that was then commuted um, by the committing authority uh, to one year and nine months imprisonment without hard labor. 
but that was Mr. Crowley. So you have a barrister here uh, being sent to prison for having acted as a judge at the Sinn Féin courts. And you must remember that because of the lack of work, barristers of all political views were practicing before the Sinn Féin courts because that was where the work was. So they must have been very scared as a result of this, particularly with military cordons, with barristers being shot and so forth, people being shot in the vicinity of the four courts, not to mention the worry about their practices going forward if the Government of Ireland Act was implemented. So a lot of worry for Irish barristers, they must have been extremely stressed. So to add to everyone's woes then, on the 26th of January 1921, there was a, a, night, a battle on the quays in front of and opposite the four courts. So here you see the four courts at night. The battle was an attack on two RIC lorries. One was passing on the north side of the river and the other was simultaneously passing on the south side of the river. And the lorries were returning from Kingstown, now Don Leary to Dublin. And they were ambushed by rebels and four courts bombs and revolvers were used by the attackers and the police inflicted casualties on civilians. They called them rebels, but of course they would argue that they were acting pursuant to the correct government. So rebels probably isn't the best term and I apologize for that. But in any event, various bombs were hurled at the lobby. Explosions uh, shook houses and trams along the entire length of the quays and there was intensive rifle fire and what was described as a weird and brief encounter. So that's how the whole thing was described as was a weird encounter under moonlight. And uh, there was a story current in the neighborhood that men were carried away through dark laneways with other men with revolvers forbidding anyone to approach or follow. So that would suggest that some of the men who attacked the lorries were themselves injured, but they weren't admitted to any hospital. So that's the culture uh, people were operating in uh, at this time. So the next thing, a couple of things that are a little bit more cheerful after this, so the next event then was a unionist barrister speaking out against on behalf of somebody who had been sentenced to death uh, by court martial. So uh, the unionist barrister in question isn't named in this, but he pleads for the life of Joseph Murphy, who has been, or J Joseph, James Murphy, I think, who has been sentenced to death by Joseph Murphy, sorry, Joseph Mur Murphy of Cork, who has been sentenced to death uh, by court martial, and he pleads for his life. And it must have worked because not long afterwards, the death sentence on Joseph Murphy was commuted. So clearly we have a barrister here, not of the same political persuasion as Joseph Murphy, who is nonetheless willing to spike up on his behalf and as a result of this manages to get the capital sentence commuted. So that's very creditable uh, to the Irish bar, a nice note in all this terror and uh, violence. And we also have a nice event on the 7th of February 1921 when the first women jurors uh, sit at the four courts. And uh, there had been discussion that women might not be keen to serve on jurors, although it was suggested that they might at first serve because of the novelty of the experience, which is a little patronizing. But in any event, women did turn up to serve in a jury. And one of the cases that they heard was a case involving a child who had been injured. And in a different report, which I talked about on my site, uh, it's noted that the women in question actually gave their jury fee to the child. So not only did they find for the child, but they also donated their jury fee to the child, which was very nice. So it was a very creditable first appearance by women jurors at the four courts. So uh, it, we don't have a photo, unfortunately, of the first Irish women jurors, which is a real shame, but they probably looked a little like these English lady jurors at bath quarter sessions the previous year. They probably would have been wearing the same sort of clothes and so forth, because that would have been in fashion at the time. So um, hopefully that gives you some kind of visual on them. They seem to have been a very nice bunch. Now, March 1921, uh, something happened which brings all the previous activities into focus a little bit and shows the difficulty that Irish barristers uh, were suffering on if they wanted to represent people who were being tried at court martial. And this was a raid on the office of Michael Noick, uh, who was um, a solicitor uh, who fought very strongly in the War of Independence and was a friend of Michael Collins. So there's a photo of Mr. Noick. He was actually Jewish. He was from Lithuania and perhaps his religion gave him slightly more protection than it would if he had been a Catholic. But he was certainly very brave and very doughty uh, defender of people who were tried by court martial during this period. 
And Mr. Noick had his offices in uh, 12 to 14 College Green. So you can see, I think it's that building there with the green frontage above them. And his offices were raided in early March. And uh, among the items that were stolen in the raid or taken in the raid were briefs that he was preparing for barristers regarding the court martials. I think they were representing clients who had been found guilty at court martial, but the sentencing was outstanding. Or perhaps like the unionist barrister previously, they were planning to make representations on behalf of their clients to uh, the Lord Lieutenant for clemency. And uh, in any event, these briefs were back at Mr. Noick's office being updated by Mr. Noick, and they were taken in the course of this raid. And obviously these briefs would have contained very important information probably about the circumstances of the crime. And here they were now in the hands uh, of the other side. So um, there were questions asked in the Commons by a Mr. Devlin MP in relation to this. Mr. Devlin said it was a monstrous thing which had occurred. And uh, the Irish Bar also held a meeting. Barristers of all political persuasions attended the meeting and they resolved that, uh, you know, uh, that they, they passed a resolution to be sent to the Lord Chancellor and the Lord Lieutenant that the privileges of the Irish Bar had uh, been infringed. Uh, and uh, subsequently, the briefs were returned, allegedly unopened, though some might say, if you believe that, you believe anything. But they were returned, and the story was that they'd been taken by mistake, they hadn't been opened, and they were being returned under seal. So the Irish Bar resolution obviously produced uh, some result. But you can imagine how intimidated with all this any barrister must have been if they were representing their client at court martial. And indeed, Mr. Noick in his statement to the Bureau of Military History, says it was very difficult to get barristers, even nationalist barristers, especially nationalist barristers, to represent clients at court martials. And he mentions three people that he approached to take on such representation who refused to do so. And these three people were Tim Healy, subsequently Governor General, Patrick Lynch, subsequently Attorney General under Fianna Fáil, and Timothy Sullivan KC, subsequently Chief Justice Sullivan. So these men all went on to high positions afterwards. They were very active in the nationalist movement, but they refused to take on these briefs for young men who were being tried by court martial. And Noick is quite critical of this. He says they all declined for one reason or another. One can draw one's inference. My own opinion is that they had not the courage to defend these men. But the extraordinary thing was that all these men became great factionists after the treaty and became very active after the split came. So fairly scathing words from Noick. And he says that he contacted James Williamson Casey, who was actually a unionist and who I suspect was the unionist barrister who was writing to the paper on behalf of Joseph Murphy. And that James Williamson threw himself into the cause wholeheartedly. And uh, he also mentions that Charles Bewley, who would have been a Quaker, also represented men at court martial and Mr. Charles Wise Power, who would have become a circuit court judge later. So it's possible that Mr. Williamson and Mr. Bewley, by reason of not being Catholics, might have been just a little bit more protected in relation to acting at court martial than Catholics. Because in fairness to Mr. Healy, Mr. Lynch and Mr. Sullivan, it has to be said that there would have been particular risk in representing clients at court martial if you were a Catholic. And I say this on the basis of what happened to Mr. McGrath and the continuing mystery of his death. So you remember Mr. McGrath mentioned him a few moments ago. He was shot in, with his, in the presence of his family at his house in North Circular Road on the night of the, I think, 15th of January, just after Hillary term had started, 1921. And there were statements about how great he was, but there was no follow up in relation to the cause of his death. So we have a couple of subsequent stories about the McGrath family. His widow brought a claim for compensation um, in the court for 25,000 compensation after his death. She got 8,000. I understand she and her family subsequently moved to England. And there's a very sad story from 1922 about the death of her daughter Maeve in Wales in 1922. And Maeve, of course, was the girl who had given the interview to the Freeman's Journal when she said, we tried to stop daddy going down but he would go so very very sad she would have been very young at the time uh, probably only 19 I'm not sure what her cause of death was 
uh, there was a huge amount of tragedy for the McGrath family. So in the story about Maeve, it says Mrs. McGrath lost her husband, her brother, her father, and now her daughter in the last two years. But there was even more tragedy than was recounted in that article, because if I just scroll up, I forgot to mention it earlier, Mr. McGrath also had a son or had had a son called Henry Garrett McGrath, who had been a very, very junior barrister. And it sounds like young Mr. McGrath was very talented. He had been runner up for the John Brooks scholarship. Uh, they said he had had a truly remarkable education career, brilliant and continuous success. But sadly, he had died in a nursing home in Echo Street in August 1919. Now, the flu would have started in Dublin at that stage. So perhaps it was due to the flu or maybe he had some other condition like tuberculosis or something. I don't know. But Mrs. McGrath, in addition to all the very sad deaths mentioned in this uh, later article in 1922, she had also lost her son. So very, very sad. So that brings me back to the circumstances of Mr. McGrath's death. So initially, there had been an attempt to argue that he was killed by Shin, by, by he was killed because of, uh, he was, you know, uh, too pro-British. You can see there that it says he was a leader of constitutional nationalists and he had previously been a former Crown prosecutor and that there had been, in, it was, he was killed as part of an intense out, effort at outrage and intimidation by Sinn Feiners. But that was in a British paper. And they also, in the British paper, in the graphic, published this picture of him murdered in Dublin. So they were really attempting, the British, to, um, to make out that Mr. McGrath had been killed by Sinn Féin. A real spin campaign there. But in fact, Mr. McGrath, there would have been no reason because he acted as counsel for Dublin Corporation. But I mean, he wasn't really in any way associated with the military regime. And there's no evidence that he was. Um, and in fact, he had stood up to the military regime, and this is very significant, in a previous case of August 1920. So in August 1920, just, uh, you know, about um, six months, ex almost exactly six months, in fact, before his, he was shot, he had appeared at an inquest representing Dublin Corporation. And the inquest was into the death of a boy called Tommy Farley, who had been killed, he had been shot, for being out after curfew very close to the courts. So Tommy Farley was a local boy. He lived very near the courts and there had been this bonfire to celebrate the arrival of Archbishop Mannix in Ireland. He had gone out to it and he was shot by soldiers who approached wearing rubber soled shoes so nobody could hear them. So there was outrage over this because he was a very young boy and he had a mother or sister who was dependent, were dependent on him. And uh, the Lord Mayor of Dublin was outraged by this and engaged Mr. McGrath, who was the, oh, the, the standing counsel for Dublin Corporation, to represent Dublin Corporation at the inquest into the death of Tommy Farley. And Mr. McGrath was very brave at the inquest. You can see there he talks about Dublin must not suffer reprisals for deeds committed elsewhere. He said there had been never murderous attacks uh, on soldiers in Dublin, and this wasn't right. And he highlighted that the soldiers had approached wearing rubber soled shoes. So he was very critical at this inquest, which occurred almost exactly six months before he was shot. And um, a, certainly in more recent books in relation to Mr. McGrath's death, there's very little written, but such books as there are, they are indicate that he may in fact have been killed, uh, you know, um, by uh, the military or the, the auxiliaries or the RIC. Uh, and they say they don't know why he was killed, but I think it was because of his representation at uh, this inquest. And if so, that is a very, very shocking thing because he would be then a barrister who was killed as a result of representing their client to the best of their ability, which is a very serious matter. And you can see how the, the British might have been quite keen to put the spin that he was killed by the other side, and maybe people then thought he was an informer, and it was best not to say anything about it. But I don't believe he was an informer. I can't be 100% sure, but I would have a strong suspicion that he was killed as a result of his representation at that inquest because he would have been the Lord Mayor's counsel. And there were attacks on uh, Terence McSweeney, who was Lord Mayor of Cork, the Lord Mayor of Limerick around this time. Um, and I think that possibly if they couldn't get at the Dublin Lord Mayor, they might have decided to go for Mr. McGrath instead when he was at the Corporation Council and he had spoken out so strongly against the military at this inquest. So I, I think it, it looks like 
that that might be the case. And it's also very touching that Mr. McGrath was speaking out at this inquest on behalf of a boy who lived in the neighborhood of the four courts and would have passed the four courts every day of his life, because often there's a bit of division between the inhabitants around the four courts and the people in the four courts itself historically. So, I mean, it was a wonderful thing really to see them working together at this inquest. And it would be terribly sad if Mr. McGrath had been killed as a result, as may well have been the case. So uh, there was absolute radio silence afterwards. No one has really discussed Mr. McGrath. Maybe it's time to kind of reopen the issue and try and explore maybe by talking to his family, because I know he had children who survived, um, maybe talking to his family to see uh, what actually happened in this case. Because if he was killed um, by British forces, uh, then effectively it must have really been because of this inquest and his representation of his client, a local lad of this inquest, and that is something that deserves uh, to be uh, commemorated and honoured. So I think that the cordon that happened the next day then was to keep everyone quiet because you remember he was killed on the Friday and then on the, 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 the Sunday night, the cordon went up around the four courts and that was possibly to keep barristers quiet, but also to keep locals quiet because they would have known Mr. McGrath represented Tommy Farrelly, who was a local boy. So I think that may be the reason for this cordon, which went down not long after because the military had made their point, but couldn't really be logically explained. So maybe that pulls together some of the mystifying pieces of uh, January to March 1921. But a lot to think about there. And I'll just leave you with this photo of Mr. McGraw, who, as I say, uh, really deserves to be uh, remembered, I think. And at least he looks like a nice man. I think that, you know, uh, someone really needs to look into what actually happened there uh, in, in, in 1921, in January 1921. So thank you.